our relationship with food has never been more dangerous. One in four Brits are obese, while a staggering 1.6 billion adults worldwide are overweight. And an incredible 1.6 million of us here in the UK suffer from an under-eating disorder. In tonight's Super Size vs Super Skinny, we hear from an American who spells out the hell of living with obesity. I'm probably awake and conscious maybe of a 24-hour day, maybe six hours. Whilst back home, the treatment course for our anorexia sufferers gets much tougher. Just, just, just like, I just don't need this. Oh, wow! Anna Richardson struggles with a boob workout. Oh. And entering our feeding clinic, Leighton the Buffet Slayer, and obsessive calorie counter, Lucy. I wouldn't think that's my worst enemy. They'll spend five days under the watchful eye of Dr. Christian Jessen, who'll make them face up to the real reasons behind their dangerous eating. It's no longer about what you're eating. It's now about what's eating you. A new week in the diet den brings two new swappers eager to change their horrific eating ways. Super skinny Lucy is consumed by the need to control her calories. And I guess maybe I am addicted to dieting because it is what I think about. If we go out, it is the first thing that's at the forefront of my mind all the time is what can I eat, what can't I eat. You know, I can't have an ice cream with the kids or I can't have this because I don't know, you know, the calorie content because I've done it for so long and this habit is just embedded in me. You know, it's, it's hard to break. What started as a post-birth diet plan has gone too far, and she's now at the mercy of the kitchen scales. The habit that I'm into now is, is, is the result of the diet that I did. It was, it was incredibly regimented. I weighed everything out, breakfast, lunch and tea, um, to know exactly how much I was taking in. And that's just formed this really bad habit of weighing everything and the need to weigh everything and know what I'm having. Luckily for Lucy, she's found our feeding clinic just in time. She's already undergone a full medical to ensure she's up to the challenge. Right, we're going to start off straight away. First up, Christian wants to see just how light 28-year-old Lucy is. 109 pounds exactly. OK. Lucy is 7 stone 11, which puts her in the underweight BI range. I'm really concerned, actually, about your attitude and your control and your psychology about food. It's showing, really, some quite alarming signs. Everything is a, a thought process, a calculation, a calorie count, yes. a fat content count, you yeah. know. Lucy dreads her daughter following in her footsteps. There is an absolute risk, I think, if I don't sort myself out now, that longer term it'll have an effect on her, and if it does have an effect on her as she grows up... Myself, if she grows up, has the same problems that I've had. Don't worry, Lucy. Some supersize help is at hand, in the form of Leighton, your new housemate. Leighton. Nice to meet you. Leighton tips really the nice scales at 23 and a half stone, which is about three little Lucys. I'm the same size round as I am eight, so you know. And to me, I would describe myself as an egg. As a hotel manager, he's first in line for the belly-busting staff buffets. Working in a hotel, I'm always, always surrounded by food and it's easily accessible. That's why I probably find that eat. And shoveling down fatty takeaways at home help keep Leighton's weight on. Which is why we've booked a room for him at the fully inclusive feeding clinic. A BMI over 40 is morbidly obese. Over 50 could be fatal. Your body mass is 57.5. And morbidly obese basically means very, very high risk of illness and disease and actually death. Your heart rate's really quite high. And you probably find that even with a short walk, you're quite out of breath, sweaty, heart rate's going. Yeah. Which yeah. implies that you're just desperately, desperately unfit. At 27, single Leighton's desperate to meet someone, but always fails to get the attention he longs for. 
At my current size now, when I do go to a bar, I find it quite hard to approach someone because, you know, I find that they're not going to be interested in me, they're not going to sort of want to talk to me, so I just sort of find that it's easier to stand in a corner and be around my friends than sort of it is to sort of mingle and talk to people because I just think people are not interested. Leighton and Lucy are going to be swapping their polar opposite diets for five days in a radical approach to break their terrible relationships with food. Time for Super Size to meet Super Skinny. Nice to meet you. Uh, nice to meet you. I'm Lucy. My name's Lee. Hi. By looking at her, I got the impression that, you know, she doesn't eat. My tiny little wrist. <laughs> <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> my lack of calories affect me and my mood swings. So with him eating that food, I'm worried for him that it might affect his sort of, um, how he feels in the house this week. Leighton and Lucy have provided details of a typical week's meals, and Christian is about to show them exactly what that looks like. Lucy, we're going to start with your breakfast. Let's have a look. What do you have the porridge with? Water. You have it with water? It, yeah. Why not milk? It was a way of cutting back on calories. Let's have a look at lunch. So, pit is filled with what, usually? A bit of lettuce, cucumber. So it's very same your diet. Do you have the same breakfast every single day? Yeah. Absolutely rigorously. No variety. No. Let's move on to dinner. What's that? Noodles, but spaghetti bolognese. <laughs> what happens if you go out for dinner or go to a friend's house for dinner? I'll always try and make up an excuse not to go. So your diet actually restricts your social life quite Completely. considerably. Mm. But what do you snack on? I'll fill up on water. It's water you use to curb your appetite. In a diet virtually devoid of red meat, fish or pulses, Lucy's only getting half the recommended amount of iron in her diet, meaning she could face anemia, which can lead to heart palpitations and lethargy. And her lightweight 1,000 calories a day mean Lucy is under-eating by three and a half days a week. Let's have a look now what you get through, shall we? Breakfasts. Let's see how they compare. Sugary cereal. Leighton, what happens next? Lunch? Talk me through lunch. Chips, uh, sausage roll, beans. Wow. Is that one meal? It's a pie, it's a burger, it's more chips. This is all sort of quite quick convenience food. They're looking absolutely terrified. Let's have a look at dinner. Looks exactly the same as lunch. Do you ever cook for yourself, Lynn? Very, very rare. More, two more burgery things. Cold slaw, full of mayonnaise, high fat, burgers full of fat, full of salt. Look at the difference already. Let's have a look at what you snack at. All right, you get through 1.3 kilograms of chocolate and biscuits and sweets every week. And crisps. Yeah. Are you shocked? Yeah. You're heading for disaster. The proportion of fat in an average man's body is 15 to 17 per cent. Leighton's body is an artery blocking 47 per cent fat. This is just oil that is in all that processed, deep fried food that you so love at your work canteen and that you eat at home. The average man needs two and a half thousand calories a day. Leighton is eating 5,400 calories a day, meaning he's overeating by eight days a week. That's not a year's worth of oil, that's weekly. No, I didn't have a half a diet, but I didn't think it was that bad. Let's face it, we're all obsessed with our bodies, weight and food. I'm Anna Richardson, and even though I've lost two stone in two years, I'm still not happy with how I look. All I see is imperfection. I've become totally hooked on getting the body beautiful. And if there's an easy, quick fix like Botox or teeth whitening, believe me, I'm up for it. But I've also signed up with a personal trainer to give my body the kickstart it needs and tackle my problem areas. Oh! 65% of women in the UK are unhappy with their breasts, and I'm no exception. In a bra? Good bra? Not bad! Out of a bra, I literally knock my boyfriend out. What can you do? I can sweep the carpet with him. Boobs, like people, come in all shapes and sizes. But what makes the perfect pair of breasts? What makes the perfect pair of breasts? Medium and fan. <laughs> yeah, medium yeah. and fan. I'm canvassing opinion. I'm interested. Small, pert and firm. Small, pert and firm. 
Thank you. Don't like big ones. No. Never had the opportunity, but don't like big ones. Well, I'll go for big ones. You go for big ones? Yes. The question is, what makes the perfect pair of breasts? Pert and symmetrical. Pert and... Pert and symmetrical, so they just stand up without a bra. So most people seem to agree that pert is the way to go. But to me, pert and a 32F bra size is simply a contradiction. If I'm to get my perfect breasts, I reckon I'll have to try and shrink what I've got. OK, straight the cam. Saying that, glamour model Sam Cook has the same cup size as me, and hers seem perky enough, so maybe she can give me some tips. Wow, 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 wow. Now, Sam, right, your boobs are perfect, right? Thank you. <laughs> Mine are not. So what, what tips have you got to make them look as good as they can possibly be? It looks good if your nipples are a bit erect when you've got no oh, top on, because yeah. it makes your whole boobs suck up. Right. So I either do a bit of nipple twiddling or a bit of the old Coke cans. Have you got any exercises you can show me? Yeah, I've got a few. Right, I'm going to get my gym gear yeah. Hang on, hang on. <laughs> it's just like a press up. The further away you are from the ball, the yeah. harder it is. And then just drop. What's it doing to your knockers? Tighten them, give them a better shape. Uh, this is how the professionals do it, Sam. I think. <laughs> oh! <laughs> oh. How, how many have I got to do? Fifteen. Oh, God. One. <laughs> Sam's boobs have been voted some of the best in Britain. And if exercise works for her, I'm going to get my trainer, Matt, to give me a boob camp workout. Get it? Boob camp? Never mind. Oh, whoa! Hang on oh, a yeah. minute. Feel That's that. really hard. Breathe out on the way up. Good. Keep the hips up and up it goes. Oh. I've been working out like a good un, but I'm still left with big boobs that are more pendulous than pert. Exercise only isn't going to slim down these puppies. The bottom line is the only option if you want smaller breasts is surgery, something I've often considered. Today, I'm going to watch an operation. But before I do, surgeon Mr Arnstein shows me what kind of results and scars can be expected after a breast reduction. Here's a lady who's you can see, is, yes. is very heavily breasted. Now, afterwards, here's the scars, and these are fairly early scars. Yes. The scar on the front of the areola is for on show, but much below that hides into the fold. So all, all you really are going to see then, really, is just a little bit of scarring down, just down the front of the breast. All being well, it heals the fine white line, but that's no certain that it'll happen like that. And sometimes you get stretched scars, sometimes they're red and lumpy and take a long time to settle, sometimes they don't settle. You, you could not be thrilled with that result. As I change into my surgical pyjamas, suddenly the reality of what's about to happen hits home. I'm freaking a little bit about this. I have watched other surgeries, but for some reason this one is hitting home a bit more. I think it's because it's something that I'm genuinely thinking about. Um, and also, maybe it's something to do with the fact it's breasts, it's integral to being a woman, and you've wanted them all your life, and then suddenly you're going, bye-bye! So, yeah, uh, freaking a bit. Find out later how I get on observing a breast reduction procedure first hand. <laughs>